Welcome to Once Upon a Dystopia, where every week I discuss a different dystopian novel and I put myself into the main character's shoes to see how well I'd do if I was facing the same situations. And also, I have planned a way to survive if I was to grow up into the same world. I should have covered this in the first episode, but I was nervous and didn't think about it until I began writing my script for this one. Did you know that you can break down dystopia into a few main groups? You have survival, like the book we're doing today, where you have to survive against something like zombies. Government control, like the Hunger Games we did last week, where a governing body controls the population in a crazy strict way or uses fear to make them behave. Environmental issues, like in the series The Last Survivors, where the moon has shifted closer to Earth. Technology controller issues, like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? The movie Blade Runner is based on that, where robots take over. Or like in Ready Player One, where everyone is assessed with a VR system. Not seen as much as corporation control? Think Wally. The company, by and large, took over and later destroyed the world. Today's book falls under survival, as we fight zombies and rot and ruin by Jonathan Mulberry. Told in the point of view of Benny Irma, Benjamin, who is turning 15 soon. And in the town of Mountainside, when someone turns 15, they either find a job or go with only half rations. Major spoilers ahead as we explore the settings, characters, major hardships, and survival techniques. I feel like in the Hunger Games podcast episode, I didn't go well enough into the details of the actual world itself. So these are the details of this dystopian world that's infested with zombies. Let's start at the beginning. About 14 years ago, the event that is now called First Night happened. An unexplained event starts turning people into zombies. Benny's older half-brother, Tom, had to run away from their home when their father turns and bites Benny's mom. Benny's only memory of that night is Tom carrying him away from his mom, who he remembers as being in a distressed state, causing Benny to more or less hate Tom, as he, as he saw it as Tom being a coward and running away when his mom was in need. Benny was only 18 months old at the time, though, so I'm not really sure how well he could remember that, but trauma can do some wild things. Flash forward to the here and now, and Benny and Tom live in Mountainside, a fenced-in town located in the Sierra Nevada mountains in California. Due to EMPs going off during first night and the fear of electricity maybe being the cause of the zombies, the town has done nothing much in the way of recovering from modern tech. In fact, a town ordinance forbids anyone from building anything too electronical and only using hand crank generators for things. And even though they receive traders in their town, they seem to adopt a mindset of once something or someone is outside their fence, they're out of sight, out of mind. The traders have um, metal sheets covering their wagons, and the horses wear carpet coats, which are exactly what they sound like, carpet, cut up, and made into coats to cover the body of the animal or person to protect against zombie bites. Benny is coming up on his 15th birthday, which is when in Mountainside they require you to get a job or only receive hash rations. He tries various jobs such as locksmith. People in town were required to lock themselves into the room at night in case of random zombie outbreak and or if you died in your sleep, you would reanimate. Carpet coat salesmen, pit throwers and ash soakers who work at the quarry taking care of zombie bodies. Zombie spotters, but Benny's eyesight was too bad for that. Working in the cadaverna plants. Cadaverna is a nasty smelling molecule produced by protein hydrolysis during putrefaction of animal tissue. <laughs> Hunters and trackers sprinkle it on them to keep zombies away since the zombies don't go after the smell of runny flesh. He also tried erosion artists who drew zombified pictures of people to help locate them in the rotten ruin. And lastly, you have hunters slash closures like Tom. But because of Benny not liking Tom, he really didn't want to do that. But after failing at or outright refusing to do all the other jobs in town, Benny has to join Tom to ensure he keeps his rations. Other things to know about this world before we head into hardships Benny has to deal with is a Dr. Pepper costs 10 ration dollars. I have no idea what the ration dollars to real money is ratio, nor do they mention how many ration dollars they receive weekly or monthly, but it sounds like 10 for a soda is a bit crazy. Everyone who dies naturally will reanimate as a zombie. Zombies are attracted to noise, movement, and lights, and outside the fence of the town, they have poles with colorful flags attached to keep the zombies' attention. They would also make tons of noise on one side of the fence to draw the zombies so they can leave the fenced area safely. It's also mentioned if you move slow enough and have enough of the catavina on you, you can walk around a zombie-filled neighborhood easily enough. 
There is also something called the Scouts, which I'm assuming is based on the Boy Scouts in a way, but they teach the kids about zombies and actually run simulations on how to kill zombies. The zombies themselves will only rot to a certain point, then stop. They don't seem to die off if they never get to eat any flesh. You learn about a place called Gameland where people will go into pits with zombies to fight them. If they win, they get a month's worth of rations or a whole box of meds. But most who fight were brought there against their will, including kids. During first night, they drop nukes on major sites, killing a lot of people and causing more death later from radi- radiation. Zombies tend to stick on lower level areas, avoiding high hills. A few can use tools and only a few will wander away from where they used to live or work. A novelty item that they have are called the zombie cards, where they were printed on heavy card stark, 10 cards to a pack. On the front of each card was a portrait of a famous bounty hunter like j Dog, Dr. Skills, Sally Two Knives, or the McCong Brothers, heroes of first night like Big Mike Sweeney, Billy Christmas, or Captain Ledger. Or someone from the zombie war like the historian or the helicopter pirate. Famous zombs like Machete Head, The Bride of Coldwater Springs, or The Monk, or random cards of famous people who had become zombs. On the back of each card was a short bio and the name of the artist. Now let's go and talk about what did poor Benny have to deal with and how would I would have reacted in the same situations. First up, it would be deciding on a job. Benny was bored with the locksmith. I would be the same. Carpet coat salesman. Benny didn't like the dude and was bored. Still, I'd be the same. Working at the pit with dead zombies wasn't appealing to Benny. Too gross. But I think I'd be okay with this one. They're already dead and you have protection against them. Seems safe and easy for the most part. Erosion artist. Benny wasn't a great artist. Made them look too angry and scary. Um, I can't draw to save my life. I wouldn't even have gone to try out for that one. Like, I know I'm bad at art. Not happening. The Catavina plant was too gross for Benny. Uh, same though. I assume you would get used to the smell and things. Like, people who now work in, like, slaughterhouses and stuff nowadays, they say that you get used to it and you wouldn't think too much of it later. And then he finally settled on joining Tom as a hunter slash closer artist. I probably would have gotten Tom first thing, um, especially since Benny has a pure hatred against zombies. You think that he would, uh, that would outweigh his issues with Tom, but I guess not. Once Benny sucks it up and asks Tom to take him on as his apprentice, Tom takes Benny out into the rotten ruin. They're going to head to Jessie's, a friend of Tom's and the mother of a friend of Benny's house and bring closure to her family by quieting her husband. Benny is only giving a practice wooden sword and Tom doesn't tell him much about the outside world, just wants him to bring an open mind and see how it really is. They meet a quote monk unquote who explains that some see the zombies as children children of Lazarus from Lazarus of Bethany, a man who was raised from the dead by Jesus. They make it to the neighborhood easily enough and sneak towards the house. When Tom opens the door, the zombie inside attacks him, making Benny yell, which alerts all of the zombies nearby who come running for them, freaking Benny out. He fights them off a bit and slams the door, then watches Tom hogtie the zombies who was inside the house. Tom quiets the zombie and they return to town without issue. My take on this is I, for one, would be begging for a real sword. Like, I do not care how heavy or solid that practice sword is. I want the real sword. They could have been separated or Tom could have broken his or any number of issues and possibilities could have come up where having two real swords can make all the difference between life and death. I also feel like they should have came up with a better plan in case that zombie was at the front door. Like, maybe one of them go around to the back to make a slight noise in the back to make the zombie move away from the door so they wouldn't have been attacked. Benny finds a lost girl card in his zombie card deck and this one thing triggers some major shit to go down for some odd reason. First, Benny takes the card to the erosion artist in town since it credits him for the card. The artist tells Benny to talk to Tom about the girl as Tom has seen the girl in person before. When Benny is leaving the artist, he is roughed up by two other hunters in town, Charlie Pink Eye and the Motor City Hammer, which, side note, what is up with those names? Tom arrives before they do any serious damage to Benny. Later that day, there is a major storm with some really bad lightning and thunder. When a nearby lightning strikes, sounds like it's inside the fence and hits something, Tom leaves to investigate. Cue zombie invading Benny's house. Mainly Benny's own fault, though, because he hadn't put the locking bar on the door because he was worried for Tom. Tom himself told Benny to freaking put the bar down, though, so good job, Benny. And who is this zombie? The erosion artist. 
Benny beats the crap out of the zombie artist and kills him. My take on this? Yeah, I'm gonna put that bar down. Sorry, Tom, but I gotta put myself first. Benny, your brother has gone out into the rotten ruin plenty of time to survive. I think he'll be more than okay in a storm for a while. I think I would have tried to run around the zombie, though, if he did get inside the house and leave out the back door and just run for my life. If I had to stay and fight, I doubt I'll have the strength to beat him to death. Though the book does state the kids are trained in some fighting skills while in school, so maybe I could do it. But I'm going to try running first. But also, put the freaking bar down, Benny! When Tom gets back home and sees the artist's dead body, he sneaks out the police of the town and try to figure out what happened to him. They go to the artist's home and it's trashed big time. So it's pretty clear that someone had killed the artist and set him free by Benny's home to either kill just Benny or both him and Tom. They figure out the connection is the lost girl and Tom reveals he discussed the girl with Jesse. They go to Jesse's house. They head inside and find Jesse near death and her daughter, Benny's friend, Nix, has been kidnapped. Benny and Tom leave time to find her. They fall into a trap where some explosives go off causing Benny's horse to scare and run into a huge horde of zombies. He sees a fast moving stream nearby and since zombies can't swim well, he has to fight off zombies as he tries to steer his horse to the water. Partway there though, he comes across a whole class of zombie kids still in their school uniforms. And this is where Benny has a epiphany of sorts where he's like, oh my gosh, they're not just zombies. They were kids at one point and he's too hesitated to go towards them. But um, luckily for him, Tom shows up and helps them escape to the water. Ooh, our boy Tom in the clutch here. Benny does a great job fighting zombies off, but when he gets to the kids, he falters because he now has this less issues with zombies and as much as i'd love to say i would be ruthless i think i would avoid killing zombies if i could obviously in this situation i kill those kids i'm sorry not sorry it's kill or be killed here benny they fell into a pretty obvious trap here as well and as much as i would want to find my lost friend i don't think i would go into the area they should have found another way around or maybe even sent one in and wait to see what happened i know that Benny seems to be thinking with just his love for Nyx and not so much in the I need to survive this as well in order to save Nyx and is making some very rash decisions about this. After they get out of the horde of zombies, they come across a road that is too blocked for the horses to go through. They find a puddle of water and one half of a wet footprint. They try harder to find a way to get the horses over the cars that are blocking the road when, bam, firecrackers start going off, drowning zombies to the area. Vin and Joey are hunters who are more or less working for Charlie. They're the ones throwing the firecrackers at them. Tom talks to them, but the zombies get too close, forcing Tom and Benny on top of the cars. Vin pulls his gun on Tom, and then Tom pulls a gun on Vin. Vin gets scared, so Joey and him runs away. Tom and Benny jumps on cars to get away from the zombies, but of course Charlie shows up with Nick's in hand, and Motor just pops out of a car, along with two other hunters that are hiding in cars further up the line, and of course they all point a shotgun at Benny. One of them shoots Tom when he falls into the horde of zombies. Nick catches up with Benny on the cars, and then run away from the guns and from Tom. Another point here against Tom and Benny. You're clearly thinking with your hearts and not your brains because, I mean, right away, this is a trap. Like, the second I see any puddle or half footprint, like, it's not even a full footprint, I'm running the other way. I would never even be considering trying to get over those cars. Nope, get away. You're about to be ambushed, which is what happens. Like, I'm shaking my head at them. Like, my God, the firecrackers, though, they're a great tool to use, though, so I keep that in mind. And as I have pointed out, Tom and Benny have now been separated. And poor Benny doesn't have a real freaking sword. He still just has a wooden practice sword. Like, give him a sword. Give him a real sword, please. Benny and Nick run for a while and find a ranger's tower and they spend the night in there. In the morning, they wake up to two men in the tower with them. One of the men picks up the wooden practice sword and breaks it. Benny tries to reason with the men, but that just results in him getting slapped and then punched in the back. Nix fights the men on her own 
and when her life seems to be in the most danger, Benny wakes up and takes part of the broken sword and legit stabs one of the men and kills him. Men number two tries to shoot Benny, but is stabbed in the back by, dramatic pause, the lost girl. Now, I understand that Nyx and Benny are both 15 years old, or I think Nyx is 14, but they're teenagers, I get it, but they really should have slept in shifts. Like, you knew you were on the run. You should have never slept at the same time. If someone is out there trying to find you, or one of you should have slept against the door so you wake up as soon as they try to get in. And of course, here is another perfect example of why Benny needs a real sword. Like, he got the crap beat out of him because they were making fun of his poor wooden sword. Like, they felt bad for the kid, and I feel bad for the kid. Now it is time for the final battle of Benny, Nix, and the Lost Girl against Charlie and his goons. They find his camp and find a pen full of kids. I don't want to go crazy into the details because this is a pretty intricate way of what they were doing and a lot of like small moving parts that I don't feel like are hardships or just things that Benny are doing. So here are the highlights. One, Benny kills guard on duty. Shreve kills him. Benny sneaks into a tent in the camp. He catches that tent on fire. He gets out of there and then he goes and hides. He gets shot at by accident uh, when the firecrackers in the tent go off. Charlie points the gun at Benny, and Benny raises his own that he got from the lost girl in her mountain cave of treasures. Charlie gets the jump on Benny and slaps the gun out of Benny's hand. Charlie grabs Benny by the shirt and slaps him twice. Charlie drops Benny. Benny tries to barrel into Charlie, but Charlie's too big. Charlie tries to punch Benny, but Benny ducks. Benny aims to, ch to punch Charlie's groin, but he hits his hip instead, badly hurting his hand. Charlie grabs Benny by his hair and punches him hard in the stomach. And who comes jumping out of the woods to say, poor Benny? Tom. <laughs> Charlie turns his attention to Tom, so Benny hits him in the back, knocking him down. Benny lunged at Charlie's arm and bit his wrist to distract him from not shooting at Tom. Charlie, in turn, punches Benny in the face, breaking his nose. Benny then hits Charlie in the thigh twice. Benny punches Charlie in the face again. A bit later on, Benny is up against Vin. Benny takes a pipe and hits Vin twice, knocking Vin out. Once he's back up against Charlie, Benny punches him in the nose, hits him with the pipe, making Charlie fall over the edge. My take at this point, I would be acting like Benny, I guess. He's taking all of his bent-up anger out on these pieces of crap. I'm like, once I saw those kids in a literal ammo pen tied up, ready to go into game land, I don't think I would hesitate using the gun like Benny did. No matter how much respect or friendship or some weird hero complex that Benny has for Charlie, at this point, it should be gone. Like, Charlie is responsible for killing Nix's mom, badly injuring one of Benny's friends, and for most of this fight, Benny is still under the impression that Tom was killed by Charlie. And Benny now has definite proof that Charlie is taking literal kids to the game land place. And yeah, he still hesitates. Like, I wouldn't. At this point, I'm sorry, but Charlie, you're a piece of crap. And you deserve everything that comes at you. Like, I feel like if I had that gun up against him, and by the way, when he, when Benny has that gun pointed at Charlie, Charlie's just making fun of Benny the whole time. Like, calling him pup. And saying that he's a coward and that he's never going to shoot him because he's just a little kid and all this stuff. And I'm like, you're mocking me. <laughs> I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to shoot you. So, But that is the end of Benny's troubles in this book. Benny had a pretty rough time. He broke his hands or his knuckles or something like that. His nose was broken. Like, he suffered a lot of damage. Nix, his friend who was kidnapped... She also went through a lot of shit as well. And while reading my next read for this podcast, where it also has a strong female side character, I'm on the fence if I should do two episodes for them, where one is about the male main character, but also one to highlight the female side character. Especially when said side character saves the lives of the main character. Or in this book, where Nyx is doing a lot of the plan to help those children escape. Like, she's on it, and she fights a lot, so... It's too late uh, for this book, and for the next one, I'm, like, pretty much already done with it. But I will consider it when I read book two of each of their series. Try to point out the fact where the side character is 
basically saving the main character's life because I think at some points Nyx does actually go through worse hardships than Benny does. I mean, she's the one that got kidnapped. He just had to go find her, but yeah, I'm going to think about it. So now we're at my favorite part where I'm going to imagine myself in this world or how I would um, react to where it would go. So I didn't write a script for this part. I'm just going to wing it, but... Where I live, I live in central Indiana, so I don't live in a, I mean, a huge town. Like, it's not a town that most people would be like, if I was going to bomb a town, I would bomb that town. But I don't live that far away from Chicago as well. So, in the story, they talk about how there was radioactive zombies walking around outside of Chicago because the radiation and the bombs don't kill the zombies they just walk around radified. So I think I would be okay. I don't think they would bomb the city that I live in. So I think I would take probably a more lost girl way of life at this point. I think I would live, I would try to find some kind of bunker where there are caves in southern Indiana. I would probably maybe go and try to find those and try to make a way of living in there. I'm lucky enough to know um, that there's a lot of fields and stuff in the areas that I live in, so finding some form of food wouldn't be too bad. Living in the fenced-in towns don't sound that appealing to me. Working half the day, going to school half the day, and living on rations, and living in a no-electricity world just because you're too afraid of making electricity doesn't sound great to me. I would also be raiding firework factories, like using the firecrackers as a way to get the zombies to move around. That would be a great idea on how to get around in the wild on your own. I think I would probably move more south of where I do, though, because if they're setting off nukes, nukes messes with the weather. And I, you don't want to live close to where those have gone off, and you don't want to live uh, in a winterized area for zombies i mean i wonder if the zombies would freeze like solid and not move or not i wonder um because the book is written in california and where they don't really i mean they experience some winter there in the mountains but like it's 31 degrees here right now so i wonder if they freeze it at but i would definitely have a lost girl way of living i would be collecting books and just read in my cave at night <laughs> by myself not worrying about other people at all, not even bothering with the zombies. I would just try to find a safe way to live on my own. Like, that's just straight up what I would do in this point, where you don't have to interact with humans. I'm going to do it. Like, I'm not going to live in a town where you're going to control what I'm doing and be lost in the lost, you know, the dark ages of no electricity. So I would just try to find a cave or a bunker or a house in the middle of nowhere, and that's where I would live. And I would live in the Lost Girl style of living. Now, lessons to learn from this book. Um, books to acquire would be almost the same as last time from the Hunger Games, as far as, like, you would need some... If you want to live in the Lost World, Lost Girl ways, you need to get a book on, like, foraging, and also on... Uh, making snares and traps and maybe like how to build simple machinery like maybe a grinding machine to grind like wheat or cornmeal or something and also a book on medicinal healing as well um i mean once you get a zombie bite you're screwed either way i guess but uh, definitely a book on how to treat small wounds and maybe how to deal with like headaches and stuff like that um in the wild skills to acquire as we've pointed out a lot in this book definitely you need to learn how to, to use a sword and knives and a bow and arrow i feel like would help you a lot here as well so and horse rack riding learn how to ride a horse but that is all i have for the rotten ruin by jonathan malmary and i hope you liked my take on the book and maybe learned a thing or two on how to survive on zombies it is a little harder to do when it is a young kid who doesn't have to take on really a lot of responsibilities in this world. So a lot of it is just young love that we're dealing with in this book. And next time we will be reading the book Ashfall by Mike Mullen, where the super volcano in Yellowstone goes off. So it, that one will be a lot more 
survival skills. Thank you for listening and happy reading.